A while back I was doing a live stream in which I talked about a multitude of different topics. Briefly, I discussed some points I had made in my Slavery with Extra Steps video where I mentioned that much of America's entertainment, especially video games, is derived from borderline slavery, this time also mentioning the commodification of the profession of psychology. Someone in my stream happened to recommend the YouTuber Jim Sterling, and let me tell you, nice well, thank you for that recommendation. Their video, The Addictive Cost of Predatory Video Game Monetization, completely changed my opinion on loot boxes. I'm going to explain that thought process and get to the profitability of psychology in contemporary capitalism. So, before watching Jim Sterling's video, my opinion of loot boxes was a bit of a middle ground. My interaction with loot boxes was with games such as Need for Speed Payback and Call of Duty World War II. These, at the time, seemed like fair loot boxes to me. They didn't have any contents that made you better at the game, and plenty could be earned by completing daily challenges. They were mostly just cosmetics like lights for your car in Need for Speed, and skins for your guns in Call of Duty. The daily challenges to earn them weren't all that complex, and if I tried, I ended up getting a few loot boxes per day. Mind you, my interactions are like this due to the environment I was raised in. Much of my family came from poor origins, which made them penny pinchers, which made me mostly immune to loot boxes. However, the debate about loot boxes isn't about people like me. Loot boxes didn't harm me because they weren't targeted at people like me. This made me see them as mostly innocuous because I wasn't the prey of these predatory triple A, wow that's really fun to say condescendingly, uh, game companies. Games that have monetization techniques such as microtransactions and loot boxes make most of their money off of whales. These are a small percentage of gamers that spend loads of money on the game. See, my opinion started to change on loot boxes when I realized that whale wasn't a euphemism for rich people who were enticed in a game. No, it was an industry euphemism for people with gambling addictions. Whaling is really just the practice of taking advantage of people who have legitimate and destructive mental problems and sees them as cash cows that can be exploited for profit. The predatory game industry was benefiting off of my assumption that whales were only rich people. They benefit off the base assumption that only bad things happen to people who can handle it, or that if game companies are so open about these practices that they must only be preying on people who actually have the money to spend on hundreds of loot boxes. Instead, these people are shameless. They don't care. They don't give a shit. If anything, loot boxes shouldn't be regulated, they should be banned. They keep many people from being able to play their favorite games because they are constantly targeted and milked for revenue by game companies. The hobbies that they once found safe and comforting are now destructive and lurking threat that has to be consciously avoided. Now, I would like to note that the nature of capitalism, the profit motive, is quite predatory. This cannot be whisked away by saying that a consumer only buys a product if they want it and that they're not forced to purchase it when that is exactly the nature of marketing and capitalist psychology. I've noted this before, but capitalists have a very flawed concept of what consent is, and predatory capitalist psychology further drives this point home. In Jim Quisition's video, he references a talk by Tribe Flame CEO Tarolf Genstrom called Let's Go Whaling. While I could use the same snippets that Jim did, I'd actually like to better summarize and explain the points Tarolf makes, but also because fuck that dude's accent. Tarolf's talk starts with him saying that, quote, I will leave the morality of it out of the talk. We can discuss it if we have time later. Clearly, ethics was the least of his concerns during this presentation. Throughout the talk, he goes through a few techniques. They are hook, habit, hobby, hot states, anchoring, the labeling technique, offers and scarcity, and social proof or the herd effect. Starting with hook, habit, hobby, this technique happens in stages and is meant to hook a player by using an icebreaker. While many players will come in with the identity that they are not a buyer or that they will not spend money on the game, game devs will try to break the ice and hook a player by giving them a good deal initially. A sale, some free premium currency to start out, things like that. By making a purchase, the player is now emotionally invested in the game, forming a habit that, if hooked long enough, progresses into a hobby, thus hook habit hobby. This technique is all about the game developer programming your behavior, taking your walls down, and getting you emotionally invested in the game to trick you into more future purchases. Modern video games with microtransactions are a lot like Skinner boxes. A Skinner box is an enclosed space that psychologists use with animals to practice operant conditioning. They will find out what buttons and whatnot an animal will press to get a reward, and then play around with the reinforcement schedules to program their behavior to do more button pushing. In this case, the game is the Skinner box, and the developer is trying to hook you to press the buy button for the first time. Once you do, their goal is to play around with variables such as reinforcement schedules to program your behavior so you press the buy button again, and again, and again. One simple way they get you to press that buy button for the first time is the labeling technique. 
This is a technique in which they try to label the buyer, or for the purpose of this video, the Skinner Box inhabitant, as a good person for spending money on the game through microtransactions because it supports developers. This, however, is a lie. No matter how much large game industries make, they still pay their developers poorly and fire them en masse regularly. I talk about this a bit in Slavery with Extra Steps. Also worth noting, most games with historically high development costs usually had as much, if not more, of their overall development budget go to marketing, not the creation of the video game. Uh, this is a point that Jimquisition also makes quite often when people try to defend loot boxes and games being sold at higher starting prices. So really, buying microtransactions, in the case of most large games, means you're paying for their advertising budget, not their developers. Another way game developers get you to push the button for the first time is anchoring. This takes advantage of the fact that most people perceive prices relatively. If you show the player an expensive purchase initially, something like a $50 in-game boost, they will obviously consider that expensive. However, if you show the player the same booster later on in the game for a fraction of that price, they will think that it's a good deal, even though in both situations, that booster doesn't have any real-world value through utility or labor value. It's a digital product. It only has as much value as the game decides. Funnily enough, the anchoring technique is the opposite of another technique called bait and switch. This is when a website offers an amazing too good to be true deal on something, which drives a click to the seller website. When you get there, the website sometimes makes you do something extra to get the sale, such as making an account. Of course, after doing all this, you find that the deal is non-existent, but may still purchase the regularly priced product on that website anyways, since you are now emotionally invested in making the purchase due to taking the time to find the deal and make the account just to see the fake deal. To continue to keep you pressing the button, predatory microtransaction techniques also take advantage of time, and two of the techniques Torolf goes over in his talk are hot states along with offers and scarcity. Offers and scarcity is a simple one. Offer a good deal for a limited amount of time with a countdown timer, or offer an item that is around for a limited time, never to be sold again. Both of these situations build a sense of scarcity and a rush. Fortnite uses this technique very heavily to sell cosmetics, especially skins. Some less reputable and scammier websites will do this as well, but will be very deceptive with their countdown timers, only starting the countdown when a new member sees the deal, or restarting the timer with a new deal. Hot states, on the other hand, give you even less time, usually a minute or a dozen seconds. These are more popular in mobile games, and are purchase choices given to you to continue a game to get a revive, and have to be made in a quick amount of time to be valid. It further takes advantage of that rush, and the fact that you have less time to think about your purchase, making some people more impulsive about buying. A lot of arcades also use this technique to make people buy more into a game. One I remember from when I was a kid is Terminator Salvation, a game I found in quite a few arcades. Every time you died, they give you a limited amount of time, usually around 40 seconds, to continue the game and keep going. This didn't give the young and childish me a lot of time to think about whether my tokens were better spent on playing other games or playing more Terminator Salvation. I mean, either way, the arcade got my parents' money, but hey, it's still manipulative psychology. There's one last way that game developers get you to keep pressing the buy button, and this effect is a bit more passive than just playing around with time. Social proof, or its more well-known name, the herd effect, is when a developer tries to convince you that most people spend money on the game, despite this not being the case. If you're in a clan or team, the game lets other people know when someone makes a purchase. If not that, they make premium purchases and content obvious when other players are using it, so they can egg you on to make the same purchases. Some games, using Fortnite as an example again, have a culture of players that bully non-buyers or people with default skins. This bullying benefits the company as it makes people who haven't been hooked yet feel shameful and like they have to make a purchase to stop being bullied. The developer will try to make spending money on the game the socially acceptable way of interacting with the game. Trollf even goes as far as to say that letting your other players know the reality that most people don't end up spending money on games through microtransactions is, as he put it, poison, and says during his talk to never do that. Now, I just went through a boatload of deceptive techniques that big video game developers are using to trick you into making purchases on their games. Capitalists have built for their buyers a carnival of exploitation. They make games and build ways to swindle money away from you and give you little in return. You don't have to be a gambling addict for this to affect you. While they do milk such people for thousands of dollars, that still doesn't mean they don't try and, at the very least, hook average people into spending money on their garbage. These are not things you can just outsmart. All of these techniques were made with basic human psychology in mind. They take advantage of the very concepts of human nature and subvert them to be profitable. Just as you're not immune to propaganda, 
so too are you not immune to marketing. What really disgusts me about this isn't just that it's all manipulative and predatory of people ranging from your average Joe to gambling addicts, but it shows what the effect of the profit motive has on psychology. Do you think businesses or capitalists as a whole put this much effort into helping people through the science of psychology? Or do you think they instead take that effort and put it, and a million dollars, into making 30-page packets about redesigning the fucking Pepsi logo? The priority of capitalist psychology isn't to help, but harm. A psychologist is much more quote-unquote useful in capitalism when they can benefit a capitalist, not a client. Especially considering the capitalists have the big bucks while mentally ill clients don't have healthcare or the money for visits. It's sad that we can take a science as beautiful as psychology and instead of being prioritized to help people with mental illness and to give them the grand feeling of catharsis, we instead put that effort immensely more into harming them, coaxing their money out of them, and selling their very mind to the capitalist machine.